Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we have something very special. We are taking a look at Jim Henson's Labyrinth, the adventure game. So this is a role-playing game set in the world of the Labyrinth, the old movie from the 80s with David Bowie. Um, I wrote a significant portion of this book. Um, most of this book is a big adventure that you run the players through, and I wrote about 90% of that. So I'm not really going to call this video a review. There's no way I can be objective about something that I worked on, but it will be an overview. So I'll look through the book, show you its features, some things that make it look really cool, and you can decide for yourself whether it is the book for you. Before we get started, quick shout out to some of my new patrons over on Patreon, including Zach Wolf, Zach Schultz, Robert Risholt, Patrick, and Christian Broomfield. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, guys. I really appreciate it, and it keeps this whole thing going. And one other note, if you're watching these videos and you really like uh, seeing all these reviews of old school and indie RPGs, feel free to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon. It helps the channel quite a lot. Um, a, a significant portion of people who watch these videos are not subscribed, and this is a great way to keep up to date. All right, so let's look at what we have here in Jim Henson's Labyrinth. So we have this great cover here. Take a look at the back. And once we look at the front cover and the back, we are going to be taking it off because underneath the dust jacket is uh, a much better cover, in my opinion, as nice as this one is. We take it off here and we can see that it looks exactly like uh, Sarah's book from the movie Labyrinth. So it feels like an in-world prop. Let's take the cover off there so we can get a better look at this. So it has a nice uh, cloth cover, gold stamp uh, lettering on the front. This whole book is Smith sewn. So it has a sewn binding. Uh, this thing is very sturdy. We have this pattern of a maze here on the front. And I should point out right at the beginning that this is not an old school renaissance, not an old school D&D book. Uh, this is very much a uh, indie RPG or a beginner's RPG with its own set of priorities and its own style of play. So don't expect this to be an OSR book. However, the creators of this, uh, the Caesars, Chris Caesar and um, his brother, uh, Jack Caesar, that's right, um, did take a lot of inspiration from old school D&D books, especially when it comes to book design. So the very deluxe presentation of this, the cloth binding, the stitched um, pages, the very high quality paper, all of that stuff was inspired by the really high quality things coming out of the old school movement. Now, something that you probably noticed already is that there is a secret compartment here that holds your dice. This is one of those features that I have not seen any other books try to do. It really stands out and it gets a lot of, it's a big wow factor. People look at it and say, that is really cool and clever. It also allows the creators of the book to um, include all of the stuff that you will need to play right in the book. So the book needs two dice to play and it comes with two dice. Now, one thing I would recommend is that once you get the book, you take the dice out and put them somewhere safe. And this is because I've shown this book to a number of people and uh, as soon as they get the book, they open it up and the dice fall out and then they bounce away along the floor somewhere. That's just gonna happen. So I would put them somewhere safe. I just wanna show you what it was gonna look like here. Let me pop them out here. There we go. All right, let's look through and see what content we get inside the book. As usual, um, you can check the description below. I will put links to where you can buy the book for yourself. So the rules and the structure and the concept of this book are all from, um, are not from me, they're from River Horse, from the designers there. So looking at our credits here, uh, Chris Teaser did some of the art, but um, most of the rules were done by uh, Jack Caesar. I wrote most of the adventure, um, but there were a number of other adventure writers too. Uh, 10 of the adventures in here were written by people other than me, guest writers. So including people like um, Patrick Stewart, for example. We have our rules here. We have a lot of awesome art and that's because 
um, River Horse Games has the license to use Brian Froud's art. Uh, he did all, a lot of the concept art for the original movie, The Labyrinth. He's a fantastic artist. So we have his great goblin art here, along with some spot art done by other people. Our character sheets here. So we have a character sheet for a typical person, um, but also one for the Goblin King. That's like the dungeon master is the Goblin King. Here's the basic structure of the book. You're trying to beat the labyrinth. You start at the outside and you work your way towards the center to the Goblin King's uh, castle. He has stolen something from one of each of the player characters and your job is to get it back before 13 hours elapse, just like in the movie. The Goblin King has a kind of clock here, keeping track of those 13 hours. This is the main way that the pace is kept up in the book, and it's one of the main penalty systems. And this is not a system where uh, your character dies. That's not really the genre that it's in, um, but it needs to have some sort of penalty. There has to be a um, something that happens when you don't play well or when you make mistakes. And what that is, is you lose an hour. The time ticks faster. When I was writing the adventure, I made sure to also put in a number of ways that you could recover hours. So there are opportunities to do that. But by and large, it's a one-way street. You're losing hours as time goes by. If you run out of time before actually reaching the Goblin King and getting back your item, you lose. The game is over. So there, it does have a very re real uh, fail state built into it. But that's not a big deal because you can start over again from the beginning. But every time you play it, the game will be significantly different. That's because the structure of the game is that there are 100 uh, scenes, right? If you watch the movie, the whole movie is built out of these discrete encounters where Sarah and Ludo and Hoggle run into some weird thing or some weird location and then have to deal with it before moving on, getting closer to the Goblin King's castle. Same basic structure here. There's 100 of them, but you're going to be encountering them in fairly random order. On any given run through of the labyrinth, you're only going to run into... Um, less than half, maybe a third of the things there. So that means that there's going to be lots of things that you've missed. And even if you do a second run through and you end up at the same scenes as before, every scene has significant randomization elements so that it will be different the second time that you see it. This gives a lot of replayability to this, and it adds almost a speed running element where you're trying to get through this as fast as possible. So there's some different character types that you can pick. Dwarves, fireys, goblins, humans, knights of yore. That's basically, you know, furry animals riding something. Uh, horned beasts, that's like Ludo, and worms. Each of these gets a couple characteristics. It's a basic um, 1D system, really. You roll one die and you're trying to hit a target number, usually about four. It can be up or down, depending on what the, gob the Goblin King wants it to be. Um, you can get advantage or disadvantage where you roll two dice to improve or, you know, uh, hurt your chances. Very straightforward, very easy to learn. And that is the point. This is supposed to be an entry level RPG. There's a lot of people who are familiar with this world, and this allows you to jump in very quickly. Not a lot of rules to memorize, uh, lots of things that are open to interpretation and to rulings. And it's all about solving problems. At least that was my goal while working on the adventure for this game. The art is just fantastic. Um, most of the art is drawn from a book called The Goblins of Labyrinth by Brian Froud. He did all the art for it. And Terry Jones um, from the Monty Python crew was the person who originally did the script, one of the early drafts for Labyrinth. And he wrote a whole bunch of background material for this uh, concept art book, The Goblins of Labyrinth. It's a great book. And a lot of the art has been stolen straight out of it and plopped into here. Some information on how to use random tables, how to be a good goblin king, and we come to the first section. So the whole labyrinth is broken down into different segments. Uh, the outer ring is the stone walls. Oh, hold on. Let me flip to the back here so you can see what I'm talking about. There's a nice gallery of movie stills in the back. And here we go. So here's a picture of the labyrinth from an early shot in the movie. So you can see the different zones of the labyrinth here. You have the stone walls on the outside. Then you get to the hedge maze is the next ring. And then you have a kind of wilderness area. Then you have the, uh, the city of the goblins, the goblin city, and then the castle at the very center. So you're going through these five stages as you progress. And each of these stages has a good uh, 20, no, 22, I think, 
scenes in it that you could encounter, although you're not going to see all of them. That's just the way that it works. I created a lot of uh, dressing encounters and uh, other random elements that allow you to, uh, you can sprinkle them into each scene to give it more diversity. And here we go. Here's what each of these scenes look like. They're intentionally designed as a two page spread so that there is no flipping required. You simply go to the correct scene. So you always start here, but you could also go here, for example. And so there are always a two page spread with all of the information you need to run it on one page, making it very easy and very short to read. Um, so there's not a lot of just staring at the page. And on this side, there's a bunch of randomization elements to it so that you can roll things up and it's gonna be different if the players encounter it a second time. This also means that the Goblin King is going to have to improvise and to figure out what things are going to be there. They simply can't memorize the book and know um, how everything's going to shake out. It's going to be different. They're going to be surprised as well. The basic structure is that you're at a scene. Let's say you start at number one. And once you get past that scene, there's usually a way to get past it. Um, then you're going to roll one die, a six-sided die, and that tells you the next scene that you're going to go to. So you keep track of your progress like this. You start off with the red um, bookmark here. There are three bookmarks down here at the bottom, which is really cool. And the red bookmark just marks your progress. And then let's say that you go, you roll a die and you end up here at the cistern. You're working on the cistern. You can't figure out a way to get past it. You're, you've hit a dead end. You, you've run out of ideas. You decide, hmm, I'm going to go back. I'm going to re-explore. I'm going to backtrack, try and find another way forward through this labyrinth. You don't roll a die and add it to this number. You would roll a die and add it to this number because this is your progress. And so basically from this point, you could get up to six scenes ahead of here, but you wouldn't be able to get farther than that unless you solve one of those scenes and find a way to push forward. As soon as you solve a scene, then you would move the red bookmark to that scene. And that would be the new base point from which you are exploring. Each scene has consequences depending on what you're going to do. And um, there's lots of different elements that can have snowball effects. So if you run into things in one scene, they can follow you to another scene. There's NPCs that you can find. Um, if you are one of the Knights of Yore, you can find a, a wide variety of different mounts. I really focus on giving this a lot of old school style problems. Even though this is not a OSR book per se, um, I wanted to give it a strong focus um, on making players deal with the problems with their own brains rather than looking at an attribute on their character sheet and just trying to get that to solve the problem. That can be a common temptation where you look at your character sheet, you see that you're good at one thing and then you just want to roll dice in order to get past it. So I try to make a lot of situations where that's not going to be very um, useful a lot of situations where it's just an obstacle. There's a bunch of problems in your way, no clear way to get past it. And the game just looks at you and says, what are you going to do? Can you use equipment that you have? Can you talk to NPCs and trick them in some way? There's riddles here. Can you actually solve the riddles yourselves? I feel like doing it like this puts you more in the mindset of the movie where the characters are having to use their wits and their ingenuity in order to overcome obstacles rather than just kind of brute forcing their way past everything. We have the hedge maze, which is the second section. Again, uh, there's tips for running it. There's some new uh, dressing that you can sprinkle into the scenes and some new encounters if you want to spice things up. So everything is a hedge maze now. We have fortune tellers the wide variety of weird fortunes. And if you can find a way to make the fortunes come true, there's an advantage to it. This one's one of my favorite. Uh, so you come to a uh, circular area within the hedge maze and there's three uh, pools of water here. If you jump into one of these pools of water, it takes you to a parallel universe version of the labyrinth. And there's six different possibilities that uh, you could end up in. And if you want to, you can just stay there and play the whole rest of the game in the parallel universe of the labyrinth. For example, you could end up in the red maze, which is uh, the, the main difference is that all stone in the red maze is made from cinnabar ore, giving it a distinct color. 
The sun is scorching hot, and most creatures try to stay in the shade. Goblins are roughly the same size as same color as the stone, allowing them to easily camouflage themselves. So there is not only a cosmetic change, but the actual people living in the labyrinth act differently. I'm running this with my fifth grade group at the moment, and we are having a great time. There's chess puzzles. If you're into chess, you can try and solve a chess puzzle. Hedge beasts, badger burrows, where there's, there's a number of like little mini games, which is something that I really enjoyed finding and sprinkling into here, where the players at the table have to sort of step back, play a different game, and then jump back in. Like the chess puzzle, for example. There's a little, you know, drawings that you can use to play the chess puzzle. But of course, most people playing an RPG are likely to have a chess set. And you can just pause the game for a second, pull out the chess board, set up the pieces, and then have them try and figure out what the optimal move is. I love little things like that. We have, I tried to add a lot of diversity. So we have like a whole heist here. Where there's a multi-level building that you can scale and investigate. There's actual little board games where you can put pieces onto here and play three different types of board games that can be played on a six by six grid. We have a duel a little bit inspired by the Princess Bride where there's a variety of weird terrains and you duel back and forth across them, trying to force your opponent into an area where you have an advantage. We have little matchstick puzzles because those are always fun. This one's almost like Pac-Man where you're trying to get to the other side and there are goblins moving around trying to hedge you in and you're trying to get around them and pick up little power-ups that allow you to move through hedges or slow goblins down. So there should be a pretty consistent um, variety of new types of little games to play as you go through it. Let's skip ahead a little bit. The Land of Yore, that's the kind of swampy area. It's also including the junkyard area. So there's a lot of different you know, types of landscapes all clustered together in there. The Land of Stench, a snake tangle you have to try and climb your way out of. Quicksand, a worm moot. The wall, there's a giant turtle that you can befriend and she can help you. And But if she becomes your friend, then she will stomp around after you, destroying everything in her path. There's the toll bridge. So this is the actual bridge from the movie um, where they have to cross the stinking swamp. Virtually every scene that was in the movie is in here somewhere, sometimes in a slightly altered form. So in theory, you could play through this game and run into every scene from the movie. Although that's very unlikely. Most of the characters from the movie are also in here, but the odds of getting them are not that high. So it's a nice Easter egg if you run into someone from the movie. You have some junk ladies. The dig, this one's really fun. So you uh, are in the land of the junk piles and there's a hole in the ground where there is a kid's bedroom under there but it's a kid's bedroom from the 80s. And there are some uh, dwarves that have blocked it off and they're charging a fee to try and excavate things from this kid's bedroom. So if you pay the fee, they give you like a fishing pole and you can pull random artifacts out, but they're all strange toys from the 80s. We come to the Goblin City. I think this was my most, I think I had more fun writing this than any other scene just because the goblins have so much flavor and I could draw a lot from the Goblins of Labyrinth book, which gets into the deep weirdness of goblin culture. You can fight Humongous. You can get caught in a cage. You can go to the Goblin Boutique and get dressed up as a goblin along with a huge number of possible goblin costumes. You can, uh, there's a trap that the goblins are building for an intruder, but you can use it to build your own trap. There's the goblin laws, all sorts of weird, absurd things that the goblins are proclaiming to be true. It's going to be different every time that you play. And you can take these laws off of this giant uh, board and then use them to your advantage in different ways. There's a gigantic sport played with hundreds of goblins at the same time. And so on and so forth. Here's another little mini game that you play by actually throwing things at the page. Skipping ahead a bit. Eventually, once you get past the entirety of the Goblin City, you find yourself at the Goblin King's castle. So this is the final scene where basically you have to chase down the Goblin King who doesn't want to be caught. Is the first section that's actually like a more traditional Dungeons and Dragons dungeon. So there's an actual map here. Each of these locations has a distinct place 
Whereas before, all the locations are fairly abstract in the way that they're connected. And they're going to be connected in a different way every time because the labyrinth is always shifting. Not so as much with the Goblin King's castle. So you can try and chase him down as all sorts of weird obstacles will pop into your way as he races ahead of you. There's a library, a map room full of all sorts of weird locations from the Goblins of Labyrinth book. The Goblin King's wardrobe. You want to dress like Jareth because who wouldn't really? His throne room, the crazy Escheresque stairway. Trying to navigate this is awfully weird and you often end up in the wrong place, heading in a different direction. So the Goblin King will often head here in order to confuse you and throw you off the scent. The ballroom, the tower, the kitchen, the armory, and then finally, if you catch the Goblin King, the end. There's a guest book at the back, signed by Sarah, Hoggle, and Ludo, and of course you can add your own name to it if you manage to beat the game. And there's a toolkit all the way back here, full of all sorts of random tables that you can use to spice up different NPCs. Right? What are the main attributes of a dwarf? Their personality, tools, jobs, mannerisms, and loyalty. You can get their names, and then so on for most of the different main types of species that you find in the labyrinth. A bunch of fun random tables, some random items. Most of these are in the different scenes, um, but here they're put onto some big tables all in one place where it's uh, a lot easier to grab them if you just need some random items. And an index, because every good book needs an index. So that's it for my flip through of the Labyrinth Adventure Game. So that should give you a very clear sense of what you are getting here and whether this is the game for you. Um, main selling points, extremely lush production values. Um, this is also a great game for beginners, especially kids and especially fans of the labyrinth. Um, if you like having a, a fun time that is not super serious because you know, it's a Henson movie and you like having a lot of variety where you're playing all sorts of strange little mini games, often multiple times in one session where there's tons of variety, you're forced to think on your feet and to think in different ways consistently this could be a really fun game for you. Links are down in the description below where you can check it out for yourself. Um, it's available on Amazon. And uh, that's it for today. Thanks for watching.